OK, hi there, it's Jeff here with an update on the UK economy as we head into December 2024. Well, back in October, we had Rachel Rees first budget uh, and it was an interesting announcement in part because there was an increase in both expected spending, taxation and borrowing over the forecast horizon. So Reeves announced a 70 billion increase in current and capital spending, partly financed by a 40 billion increase in total taxation. And that was the largest for over 30 years. Now, a lot of in, a lot of media interest, obviously, in VAT on school fees, increases in capital gains tax and changes to inheritance tax for farmers. But by far the biggest single tax increase was a 1.25 percent increase in employers national insurance. And we'll come back to that in this presentation. Government borrowing is going to rise to over 128 billion this year before falling steadily to just 71 billion by the end of the decade. So government borrowing has gone up. Uh, the aim is to achieve a current budget surplus by 2029. In other words, in that year, that year's tax revenues cover that year's current spending. Now, importantly, Reeves made this announcement during the election campaign, reinforced in subsequent speeches, that Britain will stay outside of the European Union. There will be no return to the single market, the customs union, or indeed no return to freedom of movement. And I think that's really quite an important uh, thing to bear in mind, in particular in the context of uh, what is happening in the United States. Little quiz here. Where does the government get most of its tax revenue from? I've taken the tax revenues from 2024-25 and I've deliberately blanked out two tax sources. I wonder if you can get both of them right and in the right order. Do have a go. Well, income tax brings in over £300 billion a year. The second biggest tax is VAT and the other tax uh, shown there is corporation tax. This gives you a good feel for the main sources of tax revenue for the UK government. And national insurance is a big, in fact, the third biggest single source of tax. Just by, again, whenever you think about the UK economy, consider the wider, the bigger picture. I often show this chart in my presentations to schools, and it just takes uh, the, the share of world GDP in 2023, adjusted for PPP, purchasing power parity. And it does show that emerging market and developing countries have nearly 60% of world output now. Advanced economies just over 41%. In other words, there has been a tilt in the balance of power in the world economy towards developing nations. China's share of world GDP, again adjusted for PPP, uh, continues to climb, albeit the gradient has shallowed out. Uh, but of course, China is now approaching by the end of 2028, something like 19 or 20% of the world economy. On that basis, China is the biggest economy in the world. If you look at GDP in 2023, PPP adjusted, China is ahead of the United States, uh, with India in third place and Japan in fourth. The UK comes in uh, eighth, just ahead of France, but, be but below Brazil. <clears throat> now, the key issue really, when you think about the UK economy, is why, the, why Britain seems to be stuck in a kind of slow growth equilibrium. It seems very hard for the UK economy <clears throat> pardon me, to grow by more than 2% a year. Indeed, the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, estimate that the UK's potential growth rate is now less than 2%, 1.7% per year. And the challenge for the Labour government, of course, is to try and achieve faster growth. It will prove hard unless they can achieve substantial improvements in productivity and grow the labour force as well. The worst of the inflation shock as we head towards the end of 2024 is probably behind us. This chart takes uh, the inflation rate, the CPI rate, since the turn of the millennium, since 2000. And you can see, of course, that 2022, and to a lesser extent 2023, those were the two years when the cost of living crisis was hitting hardest. Inflation has returned more or less to target and is forecast to return to 2%. Uh, again in five years' time. But whilst the rate of inflation has come down, we're still dealing with the legacy effects of the shock that people have felt in recent years. So what this chart shows is the consumer price index in the UK, again, since 2000. It's quarterly data. 
And it's quite interesting if you look at the elections incumbents in both the UK and the United States in recent months, they've, they've been dealt a fierce electoral penalty uh, in, in response to the inflation shock. Seems that people are really quite loss averse to a price shock. They notice the cost of living go up and they don't like it. Now, here's the growth of annual pay, weekly earnings growth in the UK from 2001. And you can see that from the pandemic onwards, as the cost of living crisis erupted, wage growth did rise. So the black line shows an increase in wage growth from about 4% to around 6% or 7% in 2023. But if you take off the effects of inflation, as I've done in this slide, <clears throat> so follow the crimson line here, uh, that dipped below the zero line. And whenever that happens in real terms, people's spending adjusted for inflation, that was falling. And indeed, if you add in the higher tax burden, real disposable incomes have taken a big hit. And the evidence seems to be electoral that people hate losses more than they like a win. So the inflation hurt, particularly in 2022-23, out outweighed the nominal wage gain. And whilst people are facing pressures at, how, uh, at home, businesses are also experiencing cost pressures and they continue to mount. So the budget has brought in a 1.25% increase in employers' national insurance. That will have hit particularly labour-intensive businesses in tourism and hospitality. There's been an increase, sorry, a fall in the weekly wage at which employers' national insurance is paid. So both an increase in the rate and when it starts to be paid. There's been a second or further rise in the national minimum wage above £12 per hour. And with continued high energy prices and the weakening of the exchange rate in the wake of the Trump victory, a lot of businesses are facing significant cost pressures. And my instinct is <coughs> probably that many firms will pass on higher costs in higher prices. We may well see inflation pick up next year. And a lot of businesses are thinking carefully about whether they can afford to hire workers in the new year or continue their apprenticeship schemes to the same level. Yes, interest rates are coming down. The Bank of England has started to cut rates from that level of 5% dipping to 4.75%. So interest rates are now coming down. I think they'll come down fairly slowly. And uh, perhaps the Bank of England is being too cautious. Analysts suggest that significant interest rate cuts may not be feasible, may not be realistic, <clears throat> potentially leading to prolonged high borrowing costs that could dampen investment and growth. So the black line here shows interest rates set by the central bank and the blue line shows inflation already now below, below target. So interest rates coming down, but the tax burden going up. If you look at all the taxes that come in, direct and indirect, from income tax to VAT to corporation tax, inheritance tax and others. The share of GDP <coughs> by me, taken by tax is climbing and is forecast to rise to a 70, 77 year high of over 42% of GDP. So the burden of taxation is going up in part to help pay off extensive significant government borrowing. In 2021, <coughs> the government borrowed nearly £1 billion a day. A lot of that, of course, was furlough and extra spending of the NHS. It was obviously an economic shock caused by the pandemic, but government borrowing remains very high. And national debt, total stock of unpaid, unpaid un, uh, uh, government debt, uh, has risen, of course, now to 100% of GDP. Slightly different if you exclude the Bank of England, but the chart's converging on the national debt of about the size of our GDP, £2.6 trillion. Pounds. Which country has the highest debt in the world? Well, I've blanked out a country. Uh, let's see if you can work out which one it is. These are developed advanced nations from Australia through to the United States. Which country do you think it is? The answer is Japan. So Japan has the highest <coughs> pardon me, national debt in the world uh, amongst developed countries. But actually, as we'll see in a minute, the cost of servicing that debt is, is pretty low for Japan. The bond yield curve shows how much it costs the UK government to issue new debt. Essentially, it's the interest rate on new issues of debt. Now, governments can borrow money for one year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years if they want. And normally you'd expect that the government would have a high yield on long dated debt. And that's broadly speaking true, except in October, 
the yield on one-year debt was higher than the yield on uh, 10-year debt. And that suggests some of the short-term risks in the UK, including exchange rate weakness. Now, borrowing really does have an opportunity cost. So this, this chart shows government debt interest payments as a share of GDP. Italy, one of the highest, 3.6%, uh, then the United States at 3%, and we come in at 2.5%. So 2.5% of our GDP goes in paying debt interest to private creditors. It's of the order of over £2 billion a week, and that clearly has an opportunity cost. That money, if we weren't borrowing that money quite as much and paying the interest, that money could go elsewhere. But look at Japan on the right-hand side there. Despite having the highest debt to GDP ratio, interest rates in Japan are obviously very low, so their debt interest payments to GDP ratio extremely low, much lower than even Germany and Canada. And households, of course, borrow too. So this was outstanding lending to households in the spring of 2024 by type of loan. And we can see there's just under £1.5 trillion of outstanding mortgages left yet to be repaid. £50 billion of credit card debts, a lot of other loans, uh, including things like car loans, and over £6 billion of overdrafts, etc. And debt is expensive for households. So whilst the base rate of interest is 4.75%, on average, according to the Bank of England, uh, latest figures, quarter one, 2024, you pay 7% on a £25,000 loan, 12% on a £5,000 loan, 24% on a credit card, and 35% on an overdraft. So there's a lot of household debt out there, and debt is very expensive. The key, really, for 2025 for households, if you're a homeowner, is what will happen to mortgage rates. We know the Bank of England is cutting uh, base rates, but I think those rate cuts will be fairly modest, perhaps down to 4.5% by the end of next year. It might, it might get as low as 4%. Uh, this chart shows the five-year fixed mortgage average coming down, but you know still much higher than it was two or three years ago, and the two-year variable rate. That's the one I'm looking at, because I've just taken out this kind of mortgage, and I want it to come down below 5% as soon as possible. So consumer confidence in the UK remains fairly fragile. It has recovered from the pandemic. It has recovered a little bit from the cost of living crisis. But consumer confidence is low. It's fragile. 100 here is the long-term average. It's below 100 and has dipped in recent months. And if consumers stop spending, then growth in the economy just simply won't happen. A quick word finally about Trump 2.0. Uh, the Trump administration enters power in the latter part of January 2025. And Trump has pledged to bring in a 60% tariff on Chinese goods, a 10% tariff on all goods from all other countries, perhaps even threatening even higher tariffs than that. Thinking about the countries that look most reliant on this, most exposed, Germany, <coughs> Mexico and Canada. Uh, Canada, for whom the USA makes up 80% and 50% of trade, Mexico 80%, Canada 50%. Those countries probably, if these tariffs get introduced, will experience the shortest greatest short-term pain. But the National Institute has already warned in forecast data that tariffs could halve the UK's already slow growth rate in 2025 and going forward. And this is why I would argue that Labour opting to stay outside of the single market is a mistake. <clears throat> Perhaps Trump 2.0 will, over time, accelerate plans to rene renegotiate our exit trade agreements with the EU and to at least consider hopefully consider meaningfully a return to the single market. I think that will be growth enhancing. So there we go. There's my, there's my view on the UK economy. Uh, interest rates coming down, inflation coming down, but debt and taxation very, very high. Confidence amongst consumers and businesses is fragile. So don't expect to return to fast growth in 2025. Take care. Thanks for joining in today and uh, see you all soon.